The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs elles inondent. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. Oh, Cinderella, I am just so excited. Starting this week, I, your fairy godmother, am going to walk with you into your closet and start scrounging around. We are going to take a look at the things that have fallen to the floor of your closet and have been lying there abandoned for months, maybe even years, and ask ourselves, why? You see, I love clothes, and as phenomenally shallow and as monumentally dumb as that sounds on its surface, I truly believe that the contents of our closets hold keys to the deeper state of our mental health and our overall sense of contentment with our lives. I believe that clothes aren't just what we put on our bodies. Clothes can be artifacts, clothes can be souvenirs, Clothes can be self-care. Clothes can be costumes. Clothes can dredge up all kinds of feelings, both good and bad. And importantly, clothes are a significant investment of our time and our treasure. I mean, count up how much time you spend washing, drying, folding, ironing, and putting away your clothes. Or how much time you spend thinking about what you're going to wear and trying on different outfits until you get just the right one. Or how much time you spend shopping for the clothes that you are going to be washing, drying, folding, ironing, and putting away. Not to mention all the money that goes into those endeavors. Our clothes represent a nice chunk of our budget. But how many of us actually know how much money that really represents? <laughs> how many of us would actually want to know how much money our closet represents? Or how much time we spend thinking about and dealing with our closets? One thing we've been saying here on the podcast for a very long time is that we have three main resources in this life of ours. Our time, talent, and treasure. We are spending untold fortunes of time and treasure on our closet and on our appearance. This is not a judgment or an indictment. Like I said, I love clothes. That said, I love myself even more. And understanding my love of clothes, what pushes me to buy something new, even though I have a closet full of beautiful things, or understanding the reason that items, which incidentally probably cost me some real, not pretend money, why they end up on the floor of my closet, or likewise understanding my inability or my lack of motivation to pick those things up off the floor once they're there, <laughs> this is a way I have found to get to know myself better. And remember what we said, getting to know ourselves better is the first step to falling in love with ourselves. And loving ourselves is the best way to know how to love others. So there is a non-selfish endgame to this pursuit. Our relationship with our clothes, our likes, dislikes, our impulse purchases, our regrets and buyer's remorse, those the one that got away kind of fantasies, the colors we like, the colors we hate, the styles we're drawn to, the varying sizes of our clothes and how we feel about those sizes, this can be a very rich vein of self-discovery. Leaning into all those things has been like therapy for this fairy godmother of yours. Now hear me, Cinderella. If you need professional mental health support, I want you to get it. There are reputable, affordable, and easy to navigate counseling services out there. And if you find yourself with dark thoughts, cycles that you can't escape from, anger, or any kind of emotional trauma, 
Having professionals to help you sort through these things is really important. So keep in mind, while I say that examining these things was like therapy for me, I am not suggesting that it actually is therapy, (laughs) but it has provided paths for reflection, which have really helped improve my experience of several areas of my life. Notably, the ideal life themes of personal style, mental health, gravitas, contentment, spiritual life, craft and creativity, and even environment and ecology. So that's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different areas of my life that overlap in this one topic that is my wardrobe. By the way, if you feel like we've already talked about our relationship to clothing before, you would be right. We have talked about it a lot. We even dedicated an entire episode to the ideal life theme of personal style. If you haven't listened to that one yet, and this topic is of interest to you, it was episode 24 called You Are What You Wear. Well, I hope that over the next few weeks, I will inspire you, Cinderella, to take a look into your closet and explore this rich vein of self-discovery too. You are going to be spending time and money on your closet anyway. You might as well have a method to your madness. I want to give you a disclaimer right now. I am not a fashionista. I have absolutely no grasp of trends or fashion history. As a matter of fact, I have a very bad relationship with trendiness, and pretty much the only trend I care about is the Pantone color of the year, which, by the way, long live Viva Magenta! (laughs) So, just a warning, you aren't going to get fashion advice from me. But I don't think that fashion advice is what Cinderella got from her fairy godmother in the first place. Now did she? What Cinderella got from her fairy godmother was a new lease on life. She got a dream come true. Cinderella got her ideal life, and for her, it started with a lovely blue dress. And actually, come to think of it, Sleeping Beauty had a rather fabulous dress experience with her three little fairy godmothers, too. Pink, blue, pink, blue, pink, blue, pink. Listen, I have read my fair share of listicles about what every woman's closet should contain, and I have, at various points in my life, tried to fill my closet with those items to varying degrees of success. But no matter what I would bring into my closet, the contentment was short-lived. Whether it was that crisp white tailored shirt, or is it a slouchy white button down, or the red blazer, is it fitted or with drop shoulders now, or the perfect dark jeans, is it stovepipe or ultra skinny, or the striped t-shirt, which comes around every five years or so. (sighs) Whatever the item was, The excitement of actually owning it did not last as long as I could have hoped it would. I became disillusioned with following trends and listicles quite some time ago. I would say that I officially stopped paying attention at the very beginning of the skinny jeans era. I would say that was around uh, 2012 here in France. I decided that if trends and lists were not going to dictate how I dressed, then I needed to find a standard for my own style. And I decided that what really mattered was that I feel like a million bucks. That was my plumb line. But what makes me feel like a million bucks will not necessarily do the same for you. This means that giving fashion advice is absolutely out of the question for me. I will not be giving you styling tips like how to use a silk scarf to fake a bikini top, which I swear I tried once and the result was less than convincing. I will be asking you to think about what makes you feel wonderful. Not just comfy, but what makes you feel beautiful. What makes you feel free? What makes you feel safe? What makes you feel like a million bucks? And like when you shake your hair out a little bit, like a little halo of fairy dust erupts around you. And do not tell me that you've never had that feeling before. I'm all but certain that you have. All right. All that to say, although I am going to be talking about clothes, I am not the fashion police, nor do I have any fashion cred. That was my disclaimer, and I'm sticking to it. Now, on with the show. It's a thought that may have crossed your mind once you got home and you balanced your checkbook and realized that maybe you shouldn't have bought that silky navy blue top. Or maybe you found yourself hiding the evidence of your purchase from the people you live with. And when you wore your purchase for the first time, 
you were innocently asked, is that new? And you sweat a pair of twin pit stains into your silky navy blue top. <laughs> it might have crossed your mind because you went to hang that silky blue top up in your closet and realized that you would have to buy more hangers because there wasn't one for it. Because there wasn't a hanger for it, you displaced the white lacy sweater you bought last season that you have only worn once to make room for that silky blue top. You are now standing in your closet, holding a lacy white sweater that you remember very clearly buying, thinking at the time it was the most exquisite thing you'd ever owned, and swearing that it would be the last thing you would ever buy because it would finally fill the hole in your heart. That hole. The one you seem to have been born with. The one that nothing can fill up. No amount of money spent shopping, no amount of time spent crafting, nothing can fill up that hole. Offhandedly, you say to your Cinderella self, you should really stop shopping. But of course you can't, or you won't. For a million reasons, you won't. The problem is not the shopping. The problem is the hole. The problem is that we have a hole in our hearts that we think pouring endless sums of money into our appearance, our wardrobe, and our accessories can help fill. When the hole is actually a quicksand of self-esteem issues, body negativity, trauma responses, and a bottomless pit of dissatisfaction and regrets. Until we start examining the quicksand, we will be wasting our resources. I really want you to stop wasting resources. Anybody can spend money on clothes, but not everybody can feel like a million bucks. I have a friend named Genevieve. Genevieve is the most fabulous person I have ever met. She was my neighbor in Orlando, Florida, 20 years ago. I lived upstairs, she lived downstairs. We bonded enthusiastically over lacy aprons and cupcakes and crafting and going to thrift stores and the color aqua and handmade valentines and vintage decor. We traded items from our closet liberally. I still have things that she gave me 20 years later and I still wear them. I wear an apron that she gave me nearly every time I cook, and we still send each other handmade valentines every year. Note to self, it's time to make the valentines. She is the person whose bedroom and closet, inspired by what I understood of the TV show Trading Spaces, I scoured and repainted while she was away for the weekend. I did it so that I could hang out in her closet. She had so many amazing pieces in there. In the process of repainting her closet, I had to remove the clothes and then put them back in when it was dry. So I got to covet everything in her closet twice. She said something one day that has stuck with me for a full 20 years. She was talking about a colleague from work and she said, she's not like us. She's just people, people. <laughs> Whatever this actually meant about her colleague, what I liked about it was that Genevieve was saying that I was like her, a free spirit, not like other people, unique, fabulous. Having this delightful idea of myself as anything but ordinary, I therefore became livid when I found myself embodying the trope of the stereotypical woman, a people people, standing in front of a closet full of beautiful, clean, well cared for clothes with the vivid thought, I have nothing to wear today. What I mean, of course, is that I have nothing new to wear today, or I have nothing inspiring to wear today, or even I have nothing that fits to wear today. Those five words, I have nothing to wear, have been the starting point of far too many impulse purchases and bad decisions. The problem with the declaration, I have nothing to wear, is that contrary to what we would like to think, adding more options to our wardrobe will not solve the problem, or at least not at first. What will help us in the face of all these items in our closet to find something to wear is to actually know what is in our closet, to understand why we don't want to wear what is already in there, and to get rid of the items that are just taking up space and that we can't stand. 20 years ago, when I lived in Orlando in the same four-unit building with Genevieve and our other neighbor, Russ Ross, 
his name is a really long story, but we used to regularly drag our furniture out into the yard and have dinner together. At that time, I remember Genevieve using an expression which has become a staple of my family's meal planning philosophy. Tonight, she said, we are going to live off the land. This meant that we were going to eat what was on hand. No one was going to run out to the grocery store to buy something to eat. There would be leftovers of this and of that. An oddball can of corn with Mexican spices? Sure, somebody will eat that. A few dried cranberries? Why, yes, please. A tub of frozen chocolate Cool Whip? Don't mind if I do. We always set the table with our most fabulous dishes, our best linen napkins, and our finest vintage candlesticks. Our tables looked amazing. I don't really remember how the food even tasted, but we had so much fun that it didn't even matter. Living off the land is the first step to being able to start over. Living off the land can either be dreadful, eating those two-day-old leftovers over the sink, or fantastic, eating Russ Ross's restaurant leftovers on vintage plates in our yard while wearing a fabulous apron, using mismatched silver spoons to dig into frozen chocolate Cool Whip and delicately removing the evidence with monogrammed napkins. Learning to live off the land is not just for our kitchen pantry. It is also key. It's a strategy to learning how to deal with our closet. It's about looking at what you currently have in there with new eyes. Maybe even sharing it with other people. Sometimes other people's eyes are what it takes to love what we have. So back at the top of the show, I mentioned something that we have all said at least once to ourselves when we start to face down our uncontrolled spending or our lack of space in our closet. That is you should really stop shopping. The first step to stop shopping is to live off the land. Stop adding to what is there so that you actually know what you need and what you want. It's obviously not enough to just say, stop shopping. We shop for so, so, so many reasons that are unrelated to what we need or what we want. Rather than say, I want you to stop shopping, I am going to say, I want you to live off the land. I want you to think about the items you have in your closet that you wear over and over and over again and ask yourself, why? What is it about that pilled up Ann Taylor sweater from 2001 that you love so much? Why do you love that pair of Levi's 501 jeans, but not this pair? Right now, I am not asking you to get rid of anything. I just want you, where you are right now, to think of the things you tend to wear over and over again. If it's a practical reason, like, it's my only fleece jacket, then fantastic. It's a practical reason, and I love practical reasons. For me, right now, it's a long-sleeved, lace-trimmed, super light, unthinkably stretchy, cashmere, modal blend V-neck t-shirt that I wear, and I'm not exaggerating here, six days a week when it gets chilly out. Why do I wear it? Because it keeps me warm, sure, but also because it is really beautiful, and I feel beautiful when I wear it, even if it is deep on the inside of all my clothes. I wear it nearly every day because it makes me feel like a million bucks. As a matter of fact, I want you to take a second and think about what you are wearing right this very instant. Why are you wearing it? Because you love it? Because it was clean? Because the color makes you feel powerful? Because it fits? Because you are going to see your mother-in-law in an hour and she's the one that gave you this god-awful cardigan for Christmas and you feel like you owe it to her to wear it? Every single reason is valid, but also every single reason is a little window onto your life, don't you think? If you are wearing what you are wearing because it is the only thing that was clean, what that tells me is that you're really busy and you haven't had the time or capacity to do laundry lately. I've been there. There have been times when I have thought that if money were no object, I would like to just throw everything in the hamper out and start over again because catching up on the laundry seemed too big of a task. This tells me that you may be feeling overwhelmed right now. If you are wearing what you're wearing because the color makes you feel powerful, it tells me that you probably know your audience and that you have a strong sense of gravitas. You know that how you feel on the inside influences the impression that you give on the outside and you know how to harness that power. It also might tell me that you are feeling insecure and need a little bit of a costume to help you fake it till you make it. I love that about you. If you are wearing what you are wearing because it is the only thing that fits, it tells me that you have a closet full of clothes and sizes that are either aspirational 
or simply no longer fit the body that you're in. It means that when you look at your closet, you are sharply aware of your body and how your clothes make you feel in your body and that the clothes in your closet are not helping. And they're not helping you either feel good about your body and they're certainly not helping you be at peace with your body. If you are wearing what you're wearing out of guilt, for example, that you owe it to your mother-in-law to honor the gift that she gave you, even though you hate it, it tells me that you are a very dutiful daughter-in-law, but you are doing things for the wrong reasons. Yet again, I have complete compassion for this because I have done things like this before and word of the wise, the only person you should be trying to please with what you wear is yourself. Unhook yourself from the hangers of other people's expectations of you. So, you see, how you feel about what you are wearing right now tells me more about you than just the object or the item itself could tell me. Your reasons for wearing what you are wearing are like spotlights on areas of your life where you might need to start poking around for solutions. Elle me fait bondir et vibrer, crier. Elle me donne envie de chanter, danser. Elle pousse à agir, donner, partager. Et tout simplement de sourire, aimer. After that little musical interlude, I believe that you are hearing what I've been saying right now, Cinderella, that you have a million other things going on in your life and that you cannot immediately stop what you're doing and start investing some of your valuable time on your closet. However, I want to tell you about what I started doing a few years ago, which has been an incredible help in the process of falling in love with my closet and curbing some of my impulse buying. I did a closet inventory. By inventory, I mean that for every item in my closet, I wrote down as far as I could remember when I acquired the item, where the item came from, how much it cost, occasions I could remember wearing it on, what I liked or what I didn't like about it, and if I had done any repairs or if I needed to do any repairs on it. This process took me about a year. It started with a simple spreadsheet. Each day, I wrote down the items I was going to wear that day. I scoured my memory for the basics about it, and then I kept a running total of each time I re-wore that item. It's incredibly simple to do. It just takes a little bit of perseverance. And keeping in mind, I said I kept it, kept it in a spreadsheet, but I actually put it in a Google Doc so that I could access it from my phone, from my tablet, from anywhere I was. So it really was something that was simple to do. Hear me out. I am not yet to the point of asking you to declutter anything or asking you to stop yourself from buying anything new. We're simply taking a look at what you wear and being intentional about remembering the specifics of how it came to reside in your closet. It's not completely magical, but a closet inventory does provide a certain amount of fairy dust. Putting into words what you like, or even more revealingly, what you don't like about a certain item of clothing helps reveal some of the quicksand that is devouring your joy. At the same time, as you work on your inventory looking backward, you can also add anything new that you bring into your closet. At that point, you actually can start to calculate something that I like to call the CPW, the cost per wear. This number is an actual factual indicator of how much an item is worth in your closet. If you have a gorgeous evening gown that you spend a hundred bucks on and that you've only worn twice, well, you're at 50 bucks per wear. That's pretty expensive, wouldn't you say? Whereas that t-shirt you paid three bucks for at Target on the clearance rack five years ago that is your absolute favorite and that you want to be buried in, it would come out to like, what, three cents per wear, two cents per wear? Knowledge is power. The very fact of knowing the little details of how much it costs us each time we wear a certain item of clothing helps us to have a greater feeling of control over our wardrobe. And it's really nice to have a little bit of power, isn't it? Try this. On the blog, I will put a sample Excel spreadsheet to get you started. You'll see it's really simple. It just takes developing a habit of taking an extra two minutes when you get dressed to take note of what you're wearing. As I mentioned last week, 
My New Year's resolution this year is to live out the golden rule in as many ways as I possibly can. And to be attentive to how I can make this a living, breathing reality in my life. I wanted to return briefly to something I mentioned in last week's episode. I had been talking about my youngest child and what I interpreted his deepest wants and needs to be in regard to his Christmas list. I mentioned that I believed he was hoping to cultivate wonder in the adults in his life by including them in a series of science experiments from a little science kit. I believe I said something like, this ability to cultivate wonder in the adults in his life makes him feel very powerful. And I stand by that 1000% children. And I'm going to venture out over my skis here and say, especially youngest children in a family, and as I am one, and so is the kid in question, I have a sample size of two, which, hey, is better than just theorizing in the dark. Now, what was I saying? Right. Youngest children often feel powerless. They get hand-me-downs, so they never get to choose what they want, which means that they are deprived of the power of choosing. They have to go along with what everyone else wants, which means that they are deprived of the power of doing things that they enjoy. Being the youngest means that the pool of knowledge we have is not as deep or as broad as the others in our family. So the power of knowing something that others do not know is one we are deprived of as well. If a child has no power in their family relationships, they never learn how to wield it wisely. And once they find it elsewhere, whether it's through being the class clown, discovering that they have the power to make people laugh, or the class bully, discovering that they have the power to make people cry, they only see that it is intoxicating. Power is intoxicating. All that to say, that the fact that what my child wanted for Christmas was the power to make us experience wonder. Well, that's a pretty amazing thing. I was tremendously excited to have made this discovery and to have been able to provide for this want. And then I found a New York Times article reviewing a book called Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. According to the book's author, a certain Dr. Keltner, awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your understanding of the world. While awe is not one of the universally recognized basic emotions, it is a universally experienced phenomenon that can have the same impact as, say, meditation. The experience of awe does not require us to be wealthy or well-connected. We simply have to be willing to see the beauty in the world around us. The desire for others to experience wonder is something unbelievably precious. It seems like it is the ultimate in golden rule living. I think that we could all do with a little bit more wonder and awe in our lives. So this week, I want you to find something that stokes a little bit of wonder in you and share it with someone you love. To conclude today, I want to really encourage you again, as is my wish for you this year, to find ways to safely pursue self-reflection. Over the week, as you get dressed, as you do your laundry, I'd really encourage you to give some thought to your relationship to your closet and to start making that inventory. Getting to know yourself will get you primed and ready to get to know others, and then to love them better too. Something as simple as the clothes we wear can help us get there. Be great this week, Cinderella. I believe in you. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on your listening platform. This is a huge step to growing our audience, and it won't cost you a thing but a minute and a half of the precious resource of your time. Also, thank you to those of you who have already contacted me about our little get-together this summer. I am so excited to meet some of you for the first time. This is going to be a hoot. As the details start to become clearer, I will keep you informed. If you're in the Great Lakes region, I would love to meet you, and we will be traveling a bit. So please, please, please drop me a line. You can find me on Instagram, that's at lilyfieldschallenge, or you can send me an email, that's lily at singwithyourfeet.com. A great big thank you to Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France, for the use of the song La Joie as the intro and outro to the show, to Matt Kugler, who you can find on social media as Matt-K, who sang it, and to Claude Equay, who wrote it. This is your fairy godmother signing off. 
Just remember, it is never too late to start singing with your feet.